This Artificial Intelligence and Equality podcast is hosted by Carnegie Council Senior Fellow Anya Kasperson. Together with Wendell Wallach and an International Advisory Board, they direct the Carnegie Artificial Intelligence and Equality Initiative, AIEI, which seeks to understand the innumerable ways in which AI impacts equality and international affairs. This episode features Professor Jean-Marie Gahino. It was recorded on March 29th, 2022. In today's podcast, I'm delighted to welcome an old friend, Jean-Marie Guinot. Jean-Marie will share with us profound and thought-provoking insights from his new book called The First 21st Century, From Globalization to Fragmentation, as well as reflections on current events based on his long and distinguished career in international diplomacy. Jean-Marie Guinot is currently an Arnold Saltzman Professor of Political Practice and Director at Columbia University in New York. He previously served as United Nations Under Secretary General for Peacekeeping Operations for almost a decade and during a very defining time for international relations and global peacekeeping efforts. Before joining the United Nations, he held many top level positions for the French government. He also served as a president and CEO of International Crisis Group, an independent organization providing analysis and advice on how to prevent, resolve, and manage deadly conflict. A huge welcome to you, Jean-Marie. Thank you. Very happy to be here today. I'm really looking forward to dive into the many themes of your recent book, Jean-Marie, and your timely and astute analysis of current precarious events, especially why you caution against the temptation to define issues of our time as merely the struggle between democracies and autocracies, and what has led us to this particular fork in the road, in your view, and how we can move past it to creating genuine common ground. But first, to allow our listeners to get to know you a bit better, let's start with what sparked and sustained your passions and interests to pursue a long career in international affairs and diplomacy. I was very lucky in my youth to have uh, parents who immediately connected me to the world of ideas. Uh, and if there is something I really cherish is the independence of the mind. Uh, I, oh, I think that it's very important to think by oneself. Uh, uh, my father had been shaped by uh, World War I and, uh, and then the, and World War II. These were the defining experiences of his, uh, of his life. Uh, my mother was a, a free French uh, fighter in World War II. Uh, in the resistance. And so that gave me both a taste for ideas and a taste for fighting, so to speak. <laughs> Not, uh, I think ideas are, you, you need to, to fight for them. If you just uh, live in uh, academia, that for me, that was not quite enough. I could have become a teacher, but I felt uh, I had to, to do more uh, than being a teacher. And I had to gain the kind of experience uh, that you acquire in in the world of, in my case, uh, diplomacy. Jean-Marie, I've heard you on a few occasions describe yourself as a lifelong contrarian. What do you mean by that? Yes, no, I am a contrarian. I was a contrarian in uh, 1989 when everybody was talking about the triumph of democracy. And I wrote the end of uh, demo- the end of the nation state, the end of democracy, uh, because I thought that uh, it was more the collapse of a spent system, the Soviet system, than the triumph of democracy. Uh, and then uh, uh, now I'm again a contrarian with my uh, new book, because everybody talks about the confrontation between democracies and autocracies, and I think that prevents us from looking into ourselves in seeing the fragilities of our own democracies, and also in seeing that there are other challenges, and especially the challenge of the age of data, and that we are on the cusp of a deep, deep revolution. And just thinking in the old categories of democracies versus autocracies misses all the new challenges that our institutions have to face today. So you just mentioned your first book, The End of the Nation State, which was published more than two decades ago, in which you speak of the limitations of the nation state, even its demise. Now, fast forward, in your recent book, The First 21st Century, From Globalization to Fragmentation, you argue that nation states continue 
being challenged on multiple fronts. What has changed? How and to what end in your view? Yes, and actually the first title of my book in French was La fin de la démocratie, the, the, democracy, the end of democracy. But uh, the title was too much to swallow for uh, an English or an American audience. Uh, because my idea was broader, actually, than the end of the nation state. This was the first book to reflect on the impact of globalization, in a way, on communities. And when I, when I wrote it, uh, I did not have the sense I have today of the importance of being part of a community. I thought it was just fine to be a world citizen. Uh, having gone through peacekeeping, having been the head of peacekeeping in the United Nations, having seen societies torn apart, uh, I see much more the importance of having uh, boundaries, of having an horizon that you're familiar with. And that has, in a way, given me a greater sense of the precariousness of societies uh, than I had when I wrote my first book and also a greater sense of a need to have uh, a community, to be rooted in a community. And the challenge in our world of being rooted in a territorial community, we are still uh, people who live in a, three, in a physical world. We, are, we live in three dimensions. And so proximity, friends, uh, the comfort of seeing things you're familiar with, that still matters. But at the same time, we know that this, this, limited, this limited physical community uh, is not enough uh, that we need in a global world. And that these physical communities, they are also now in competition with virtual uh, communities. Uh, and that, uh, that is a completely different new world, that uh, this competition of the virtual that I had not anticipated in my first book. In my first book, I saw how our destinies could not be just bound by the limited territory of the nation, but I couldn't see that we were no longer living in a world of three dimensions. We would be living in a world of four dimensions. Uh, and that is something we have to get accustomed to, and that profoundly changes, I think, the way politics uh, are, are, are being managed. Uh, the way we legitimacy is created. Uh, this is this is a revolution that we are that has just begun, and we haven't yet fully understood all its implications. And that's what I'm trying to to do in my book, in a way. There's a quote in your book that stayed with me. You write, "With both the internet and artificial intelligence shaking up the hierarchies of knowledge and power," and to paraphrase you. We are entering a transformative period, even a perfect storm, an age of revolutions, if you may. You even go as far to argue that it could lead to a second renaissance, rich in promise, yet equally rich in peril and potentially also conflict. Can you please elaborate for our listeners? Yes, we remember the first Renaissance when we, re when we visit museums, when we see Leonardo da Vinci and all the great artists of that period. We forget that this period was also the period of the wars of religion. It was a period of violence that lasted for, for more than a century. And uh, today we are in an age of weapons of mass destruction, so we cannot afford a kind of trial and error where we fight and then we find the right solution. Uh, we have to uh, really address the issues of today in a much more diligent uh, manner. And what strikes me uh, today is that we are in a way facing a double revolution. The a revolution that is comparable to the invention of the printing press, uh, which uh, showed its impact over a course of centuries, because in a way you can say that, uh, for instance, the, uh, uh, the invention of the bourgeoisie as a ruling class was very much linked to the dissemination of knowledge, and that really happens in the 18th and 19th centuries. So what happened at the very end of the 15th century develops over several hundred years. Uh, the internet 
uh, it's a matter of years and decades, not centuries. So the pace of transformation is enormously faster than what we saw in the past. That's the first revolution, the revolution in the foundation of legitimacy uh, brought about by, by the internet and the what I call the age of data. And the second revolution, which is comparable to the industrial revolution of the late 18th uh, and 19th century, is that this new age of data uh, redistributes wealth and power. You see it in the stock market. You see how all the biggest companies of the world now are data companies uh, with capitalization that will, uh, way above the traditional uh, uh, value, stock market value of uh, industrial uh, companies. The distribution of wealth, the redistribution of wealth uh, through uh, the age of data, through this new technology is just enormous. And at the same time, it's a redistribution of power uh, because indeed, and we, and we see it every day, the, the capacity to, coll to collect and then to manage, and, uh, and of course, managing uh, data is the key, uh, gives a power that is unprecedented, that cannot compare to any uh, power in the past. The challenge, of course, is that the, those data, there's so I mean, the volume of those data, which are which is which keeps growing exponentially, uh, because now at every second of our life, we leave uh, we leave a trace, uh, we leave a data uh, which can be collected, which can be stored, and which can be managed. Uh, that mass of data cannot be managed by human beings. It's just too much. Uh, you would have have the population of the world managing the other half. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Uh, so that's where uh, artificial intelligence algorithms come into into the picture. Uh, and so that's where it's also a revolution of power. Because when we think of power in traditional terms, we think, oh, uh, there used to be the the, the heads of the big uh, steel in the steel industry, the big uh, industrial companies that were the masters of, of the world, I mean, the sort of uh, Marxist view uh, of, of power. Now you cannot even say it's the masters of uh, the owners of Google or Facebook or Amazon who are the masters of the world because they themselves, I mean, they, they, are, they are not the prisoners, but they, uh, they depend on uh, on the data they manage, and and the same uh, applies to states. Uh, you can say, oh, the Communist Party of China is uh, with collects an enormous amount of data on uh, Chinese citizens, uh, is going to be all powerful as no dictatorship ever was. That is true only up to a point because the Communist Party of China cannot manage by itself all those data. It has to depend on algorithm and those algorithms, they themselves are self-learning. Uh, so uh, uh, it's not as if a central committee would decide what is the right algorithm. Uh, the, the power that is being created in a way dominates those who have created it. And, and so this combination of a double revolution, revolution of legitimacy be comparable to the printing press, revolution in power and wealth. That is an earthquake in the history of humanity, which uh, I think happens um, very rarely. It's, it's one of the major turning points uh, of the last two millennia. And what do you feel will be the direct impact well, first, I mean, we are just on the cusp of it, and I would like to be 20 years old to know how it will look uh, 50 years uh, from now, because I think no human mind can really anticipate the extent of the transformations that are going to happen. But from what uh, I can see today, first, I think the, the institutions that were built uh, for an aid, for the pre-data age, uh, the institutions on which we rely, uh, they are completely overwhelmed 
by uh, this uh, revolution. They are overwhelmed in many ways. They are overwhelmed because the, uh, the data revolution changes the way people relate to each other. It creates, uh, and for the moment we see largely the negative side of it, in the sense that we see how it, uh, help, it helps create sort of self-contained tribes, so to speak. Uh, self-referential tribes which do not speak to each other. You see how the internet facilitates the creation of, uh, of such, uh, such groups. And in that sense, it destroys the common ground, which is the foundation of any uh, democracy. You see in, our, in all democratic countries how people have a harder and harder time talking to each other. They talk to people who are just like them. The, the notion of the difference of the debate uh, is uh, is weakening, and so our institutions that have been founded on the idea of debate, of a common ground, uh, they struggle uh, with that. They don't know how to to handle that fragmentation of society. That's why uh, my book is uh, from globalization to fragmentation. The data revolution encourages an enormous fragmentation of society. In, in a way, it's a paradox. At the same time, it's a, it's a world wide web, it's global. But within that globality, you see how groups form uh, to, to relate to each other on the basis of uh, it's a kind of glorified selfie rather than accepting uh, people who are, who are different. So that's, that's, that is the, the first impact. The society that is produced by uh, data is profoundly different from the society in which uh, the institutions that we live with were, were, were created. Uh, and we and the adaptation is lagging um, behind uh, uh, badly. And another aspect is that indeed uh, the, this new uh, way of relating means that non-territorial links can be as strong and sometimes stronger than territorial links. Uh, and that the, the, the proximity, which has always a moderating influence, because if you see, People from day to day, from one every every week, every day, uh, it creates a kind of peer pressure uh, to to adjust, to take into to respect. Uh, if you see people are just like that, you have just chosen. If there is not the uh, the surprise of meeting someone you don't know, if it's only people that you choose on the basis that they are just like you then you don't have that moderation that is brought by diversity. Uh, so that's, that's the first impact, a profoundly transformed society. The second thing, which is fundamental, is that uh, this, uh, the management of data creates enormous power, as, as I said. Uh, how to control that power? For the moment, uh, we see that the debate, and we see it in Europe with the directive on the protection of, uh, uh, of data uh, and personal data, uh, the GDPR, uh, you see in Europe how uh, the debate is largely about limiting the power of monopolies uh, and protecting each individual as if he was the owner of, its, uh, of his or her own data, which is part of the, which is an issue, uh, no question, but at the same time is, uh, raises more question than it answers because the data, they are all created through relation to someone else. So uh, when we have a conversation, I am, the, am I the owner of the, the data that are generated by this conversation? Are you the owner? These questions are there every day. And we all know when we are asked if you uh, consult a website in Europe, you have to tick a certain number of uh, boxes. Uh, most of the time we just tick all, all the boxes because we don't really have the patience uh, to be the, uh, to, to, to protect uh, our, our data. And so this notion of just protecting the individual as the master of his or, or her own data is, is just a very narrow part of the issue. The, the deeper issue is how do you, how are you going to supervise to have some control over the management 
of, of the data? Who is going to look at the algorithms, whether the algorithms are fostering, let's say, hatred, or they are fostering uh, uh, harmony? Uh, what is the societal answer uh, to, to, to that? Uh, and it's all the more difficult because as we discussed, they are self-learning uh, algorithms. So uh, when you... Uh, when you approve, let, let's, let's assume that some committee uh, approves uh, an algorithm. Does he approve the evolution of the algorithm? <laughs> uh, does he approve uh, the initial algorithm? This is an, an open uh, question that would need to be, to, be, to be answered. And this control of the power of data raises a fundamental issue, which is the relationship between knowledge and democratic accountability. Uh, we live in a world where knowledge takes an increasingly important place, and data are just one particular aspect uh, of that. Uh, in uh, every minute of our daily lives, whether we use our phone, uh, our car, there are lots of things that we don't really understand. Uh, but that we use. And there are also lots of, lots of things that actually are better managed uh, through uh, by knowledgeable people than just by the lay citizen who is overwhelmed uh, by the amount, who cannot, no, nobody can master the enormity of the knowledge that is accumulating uh, every day. You can be a specialist in biology, you can be a specialist in electronics, but there's no uh, Renaissance man à la pique de la Mirandole who would, uh, um, who would have the whole uh, uh, world uh, in her mind or his mind. That is, that is beyond reach. I mean, it has been beyond reach uh, for now a few centuries, but today it's, the knowledge is growing exponentially. And so it becomes uh, a challenge to democratic accountability. And the question of how you balance the, account, the legitimacy of knowledge and the legitimacy of uh, democracy is something that we haven't really resolved. And the issue of the control of data puts it in a very stark uh, light. Let me, let me take an example to make that a little more concrete. Uh, we have had this COVID uh, pandemic and uh, governments uh, which are uh, well I mean, managed have usually created a scientific committee to give them advice on uh, how to handle the, uh, the, the pandemic. But what is striking is the confusion over the role of such scientific uh, committees. I have heard many politicians say, let science decide, uh, which is reassuring and misleading <laughs> uh, because indeed uh, science can give you a uh, better opinion that, uh, than a lay person about, let's say the risk of uh, catching the virus or the, ri the risk of dying uh, of it. That is a scientific issue. There may be a range of opinions, but science will help narrow down uh, that range. Does that tell you what the policy should be vis-a-vis -vis, uh, COVID? Absolutely not. The science is good at defining uh, the, the risk. Is it good at telling you what risk you can take? No, that's an essentially political uh, decision. And the political decision is really balancing different risks. There's economic risk, there's a health risk, uh, and there is just the amount of risk that a society, as a society, is prepared to take or not to take. That is not a question that uh, the best scientist can answer. That's a decision for a community of human beings uh, to, to, to decide. And I, I take that example of COVID because this is something that is on the mind of, of all of us because we have been through it for now more than, uh, than, than two years. But you can apply that to any aspect of society, including the data situation, because you uh, talk about risk. You can say, and this is now 
uh, a very live concern. You can say you, there is a risk of uh, terrorism, there is a risk of uh, 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 data breach that can create uh, economic havoc. Uh, there are lots of, uh, of risk that can be identi identified by, by specialists and by technicians. Um, the, the, but the balance between those risks and the society, that's a political uh, decision. And when it comes to the control of, uh, of the power of, of data, that is a high, that is a decision that needs to be informed by knowledge because the average person will have no clue. And I, I wouldn't have any clue on, you know, if, I, if I'm given uh, an algorithm and the, the sequence of equations that define that algorithm, I will be at a loss. I don't have a PhD in mathematics or computer science. Uh, I will be at a loss. I need the expertise of the specialist. But at the same time, uh, the balance between uh, uh, privacy and collective goods, the, the balance between competing values that define a society, that balance is in essence a political decision. And so you asked me, what uh, you know? What are the implications uh, for institutions? Well, uh, the institutions that can control that new power—they are not yet really in place. Yes, there are authorities here and there, but the relationship between the democratic institutions and the, the institutions of knowledge, so to speak, that is still uh, to be defined. And I think this is going to be one of the great deba debates. Of, of the future, and it goes beyond actually the question of uh, data. It's the question of in a society where knowledge is becoming more and more important, biology, gen genetics, etc. Et um, we, we're going to see more and more the importance uh, of knowledge, but the balance between the legitimacy of knowledge and the legitimacy of the collectivity of a democracy that is something that will need to be to be fixed. And I think the malaise, the malaise that we see in contemporary institutions owes a lot uh, to that. And uh, we see the reaction of, uh, of people who either slavishly embrace uh, science, even including forced science, crackpot uh, science, or on the contrary say, oh, Everything when uh, you can say the the earth is flat, the earth is round. Uh, every opinion uh, has to be accepted. Uh, so it's it's a tension between uh, a complete misunderstanding of what science is or complete dismissal of uh, of science, and both are bad. And it's a reflection of the lack of an intelligent thought through relationship between the legitimacy of knowledge and the legitimacy of, democ of democracy and the collective body. And the legitimacy of intelligence. Yes. <laughs> and the one problem of our societies is that you have a lot of, uh, how would I say, half intelligent people. <laughs> uh, we're all a bit like that because we, we have read in newspapers about all the things that are happening in, uh, in the technological front. So we form half-informed opinions. And that is the most uh, dangerous uh, thing. Uh, I think it's the Spanish uh, intellectual uh, Ortega Gasset, uh, uh, who, 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 who really was worried about the, uh, uh, the way specialized uh, uh, scientists uh, could uh, in some ways completely miss uh, the point uh, and uh, miss uh, the real nature of science. Uh, science uh, is not uh, just providing the answers, it's providing new questions. <laughs> uh, and I think most people see science essentially as providing the answers as if you know the world was a closed room and you have a nice broom with which you're going to to brush the dust of ignorance 
and uh, at some point you will have finished and the room will be all cleaned uh, with knowledge. Uh, that is not uh, the way knowledge works. Knowledge is more like a sphere in perpetual, uh, perpetually expanding, which means that the surface of contact with uh, the unknown keeps increasing. That is, if you know very little, uh, there is very little you want to know because your your surface of contact, so to speak, with the unknown is very limited. It's limited by your knowledge. Uh, if you know a lot, and this world knows a lot, there are more and more questions that, that arise. Uh, and so the more you know, the more you understand that science is problematic, that science is the art of asking new questions. It's not uh, cleaning up the room so that at the end everything is answered. That's why you can say Newton is a great scientist, uh, but then comes uh, uh, relativity, comes Einstein, which asks new new question, and someone will come after uh, Einstein who will ask again question that uh, uh, Einstein uh, did not uh, answer, and that doesn't mean that doesn't make Newton wrong or Einstein wrong. It shows how the expanding, this expanding sphere of, uh, of knowledge uh, keeps creating new questions. And this looks like a very abstract uh, discussion. It is a bit, but, uh, but the reality is that it's, it's, it, it is very important for the way our societies work. Because if you don't see knowledge as something that creates questions, very quickly you turn to fanaticism. You, you turn to the non-problematic view of society, where you think that problems only have one answer, uh, and that you are aiming at an all-powerful answer that will just close the discussion, so to speak. Uh, well, if you, if you understand the fundamentally problematic nature of, of knowledge, you are prepared to accept that there are competing answers uh, to a question, and that it is a very arrogant position to think that there is one answer that should uh, uh, dominate uh, all the others. Uh, and personally, I believe that uh, in uh, our world, uh, in our very diverse world, uh, if we believe in, if we want to have a world that is pluralist, uh, it's very important to have that problematic view. Otherwise, and I come to the to my first book, which was in a way a challenge to uh, Fukuyama and the end of uh, history, uh, and so everything comes uh, together uh, here. If you if you believe that there is just one answer, that, uh, that creates intolerance, and that is in this world completely uh, unacceptable uh, to, to many people. You have to accept that different societies will have different, a different balance between competing values. That they are, and uh, Isaiah Berlin said very well that you can have there can be good values that are in competition uh, with each other. <laughs> uh, but each society uh, balances those values in a different way. Uh, and so you can have a society that puts a lot of value on the collective and less value on the individual. You can have another society where it's a different uh, balance. Is one better than the other? That is a judgment that I refuse uh, to make. And uh, that's why the notion of liberal democracy as the system that ends history, uh, that uh, is the conclusion, uh, so to speak, uh, I think it's not only unrealistic, I think it's dangerous. Uh, uh, I think it, it uh, and today, with the, uh, now with this uh, horrible war in Ukraine, and the way uh, many people try to uh, 
pitch it as the, the sort of final struggle between democracies and autocracies. Uh, uh, this is, in my view, a very simplistic way uh, of uh, describing uh, the world. And it's a simplistic way that ignores all the discussions within our own societies, what we, what we have been discussing until now. Uh, what, are, what is the right balance between all those competing values? And there is not one single uh, answer. And, uh, and I d deeply dislike autocracies, but I think this simplistic opposition makes no sense. Uh, and prevents us from looking into ourselves. Just as when uh, the Soviet Union collapsed, we were so, uh, so proud of uh, what we thought was our victory, while in reality it was more the collapse of uh, an exhausted uh, system. We were so proud of our victory that we did not look into ourselves. And now with Russia, pushing its sort of ethno-nationalist agenda. It's the Russian way, it's the Putin way of addressing the fragmentation of societies, very dangerous, uh, very dangerous way. Uh, with Russia put, uh, pushing this ethno-nationalist agenda, uh, we can uh, happily say, oh, uh, we are the good guys uh, because we don't have uh, that agenda. We are democracies. But that does not answer a much more fundamental question. What keeps us together, what holds our society uh, together. And having just the definition of an enemy as the best way to keep our societies together is a, is a very bad and insufficient uh, answer, especially at this moment with the new age of data where we have to, to rethink so much of our societies. And I'm afraid that if we, if we take that kind of uh, reductionist, I mean, a very narrow view of what the world is today, instead of uh, looking at all the issues, the new institutions, uh, uh, the uh, new way of organizing ourselves that the age of data should uh, force us to do, uh, we just are going to, to be smug uh, and think we have all the answers because we are not Russia. Uh, and it's good that we are not an ethno-nationalist uh, country, but that is just the first step. There's so many others that we have to take if you want to have an appropriate answer. And well, not appropriate answer, actually appropriate answers, because they are, uh, they are not, there's not one answer. You spoke of something that is near and dear to my heart as well, which is the importance and skill set of asking and refining questions and how asking questions is part of creating healthy, pluralist societies that embrace the diversity of views and opinions, creating common ground rather than retreating into hubris, if you may, focusing merely on coexisting. It brings me, however, to the how. What is to be done in your view? Well, I, I think uh, the way we organize education uh, is absolutely uh, essential. Education on science, education on history. Education on science so that I think that rather than, I mean, of course you, you need to be, uh, to be good at math and physics and, uh, and it's important to have the basics of, uh, of uh, key components of, of modern science. But I think it's important for in school to, to learn a bit about the history of science so that you, you understand what, what, I've, what I described as the, the sort of problematic uh, aspect of science. Uh, I also believe very much in, uh, in history because we have a tendency to have a non-historical view of things. We judge the past from the tribunal of the present, uh, so to speak. We don't, uh, we don't see the present as something that is built on all the efforts of the past, the efforts and the misconceptions and uh, the limited uh, uh, the, the, the failures uh, and some things that looking from at the past uh, from today, we, we say, oh, how narrow minded were they? I mean, they tolerated slavery. Uh, how could they do that? 
And of course, it's, and this is not to say that slavery uh, was good uh, at the time of Plato and is bad now. Slavery was bad at the time of Plato uh, as it is bad now. It's not about being relativist uh, on the question of slavery, but this is recognizing that if today we see as something self-evident that enslaving other human beings is something abhorrent, it is built on centuries of thinking and refining thinking, just as uh, Einstein would not exist if there had not been Newton before him. And it, before Newton, there had not been Archimedes and, and others. Uh, and I think this notion that the human condition is built on all the efforts of centuries of asking new questions and refining the questions and developing new answers to those new questions. That is what we need to learn. And so I think the, the teaching history in class and history in that sense, uh, having an understanding of how people thought in different centuries and how that thinking has been gradually transformed, I think is, is very important. Otherwise, we, we have a, a non-historical view uh, of the present. And if we, if we don't have an understanding of the past, we won't be able to have an intelligent understanding of the future. <laughs> uh, because we won't have the, again, uh, the sense of, uh, how I say, a, a variety of possibilities that uh, nothing is preordained. Uh, that's it, a continuous effort. And there's always that tendency because we, we hate uncertainty. Uh, human beings are not wired, so to speak, to deal with uncertainty. They, most human beings hate the prob uh, prob probabilistic way of uh, thinking. This is, we like yes or no. Uh, probabilistic is a concept for mathematicians. It's not a concept for, uh, for, for lay people. And yet, if you, if you want to live in a livable society, uh, you have to accept uh, that variety of possible uh, outcomes and to nurture uh, that rather than pretending that there is one outcome that is, uh, and history there can help us understand that, I think. You have been a very strong proponent that the story of technology is also the story of humanity, of being human. And you alluded to earlier this danger of reductionist narratives. Yes, well, absolutely. The uh, the you know the steam engine multiplied our physical power, uh, and it turns and it's and you see in the in the long term curves of uh, production how suddenly at the end of the 18th century uh, the production the curve of production outpaces. Uh, the curve of the growth of, uh, of uh, population growth. And that's how people uh, become uh, richer and the world uh, gradually begins to emerge from extreme uh, poverty. With, uh, with AI, with the data civilization, uh, our brain power uh, is being uh, multiplied in a, in a, fantastic, uh, in a fantastic way. And, but it will be what we do with it, you know, with the steam engine, it uh, helps uh, make tanks <laughs> and it helps make cars and make all sorts of good things and uh, more dangerous uh, things. And, uh, and I think it's going to be, it's the same with the brain, uh, the brain power. The, the one thing where uh, I am not, well, I think we don't have the full answer. I'm not sure I'm, complete, I'm completely in agreement with you. I think we are groping for, for the answer. Is that uh, indeed the, we, would want, we want uh, AI, we want uh, this new technology to be our instrument, uh, our, our slave, so to speak, as the machine uh, is supposed to be our, our slave. But when it comes to brain power, uh, it's a bigger question uh, because we, uh, we are not sure whether the slave can become, could become smarter than us and outwit us, so to speak. 
Um, and there are all sorts of books of science fiction uh, on that. And actually the debate is open between uh, specialists who know much more about those issues uh, than I do on uh, how you, you keep uh, the ethical control, uh, so to speak, uh, of, these, of these machines, of these virtual uh, machine or the software uh, that we, we, we are creating. Uh, and it brings us back to uh, a point I, uh, I have made, you know, on the balance between knowledge and politics and risk, uh, because it's really about uh, defining the sphere that, that has to be left, led uh, to, the, to the machine uh, and to, to, to the science, and the sphere where it's about human values, it's about ethical choices, and uh, the machine can help inform some ethical choices, uh, but it should not uh, make them for us. And that's a debate which, uh, which should take us uh, away from our sort of uh, individual self. Uh, that's a debate that has to be had in a collective uh, way because uh, it's it's about our vision of a society. It's uh, it's an arbitrage between the individual and the collectivity. It's also an arbitrage between the present uh, and and the future. Uh, what value we give to the future, and that value uh, varies from one society to the other. It's uh, it's almost a religious uh, issue. Uh, how how you discount. The, the rate of discount of the future. Uh, what value do you do you give to the future? I remember a discussion uh, I had in Timor Leste on on uh, on the wealth fund that Timor Leste was uh, was creating uh, under the advice of Norway, uh, and and it was a very good thing to uh, to uh, very good advice to give to the Timorese. At the same time. Uh, the Timorese, when the life expectancy uh, of a child was maybe uh, there was a high risk that he might, might die, that the child might die before the years uh, before, before uh, reaching uh, years of five, uh, the future does not have the same price in a very poor country like uh, Timor Leste uh, and uh, in a country in a rich country. Uh, like Norway, where the life expectancy is uh, 80 or more. Uh, and so these, these are value uh, judgment that have to be made uh, by a society that collectively decide what price it gives to the future, what risks it's willing to, uh, to take uh, or, not, uh, or not to take. So if I understand you correctly, Jean-Marie, shall we be prepared for more so-called black swan events? Or should we really focus on strengthening our ability to think the unthinkable? Well, black swans, by definition, uh, they are unexpected. Uh, so if I say there are going to be less uh, black swans, uh, it doesn't say anything on black swans, because uh, it means that I don't predict what is not predictable. <laughs> uh, uh, so the honest answer is I don't know. But I do think actually uh, that the transformation that are happening are on such a wide front because the age, uh, the, the age of data and the knowledge that can be acquired by managing data has, uh, I mean, has use in, in all disciplines. You know, I, uh, I was uh, visiting a, a lab in Paris on bio, uh, technology and uh, bios where they use uh, artificial intelligence to manage myriads of um, processes that happen in the brain, for instance, where you cannot, uh, where you, you have to take a statistical approach and you have to use artificial intelligence to, uh, to detect uh, patterns. So just an example how one part of science, data science, uh, statistics, uh, data science st that helps collect massive data, statistics uh, that helps manage those data, and then uh, biology that uh, studies the functioning of the brain. They come together, 
uh, producing uh, new new knowledge. And I think this is happening, this is just one example. And I think it's happening in, in dozens of new areas. So the possibility that every once in a while, these connections between different areas of knowledge uh, produce something completely unexpected, I think is a, is a, distinct, uh, is a distinct possibility. So I would think at the end of the day that the possibility of surprises of black swans is real. Uh, and that is why, again, it's another, uh, another reason uh, to have a pluralist view of institutions because we are in such a fast moving world that the, the very notion of having a sort of static vision of what are the right institutions for that world is hubris, is wrong, uh, because uh, the world is a, is a fast moving target. And so the best institutions are the institutions that will be the most adaptable uh, to that world, which is continuously uh, changing. Uh, so we have to have institutions in a way for a black swan world, uh, for a world that will keep surprising us. Uh, and, and that's why we have to accept that different societies will provide different answers because of their history, because of their memories, different memories. They will pro produce different answers. And as the world keeps changing, we will see that some answers are better than others, but it will keep, it will keep moving. And that's a good thing rather than trying to find the ideal answer that does not exist. You mentioned earlier the importance of data to help us understand these new shifts and also how data can help us mitigate negative impact and outcomes. And we indeed possess and access unprecedented amounts of data about each and every one of us, including states and states' behavior. We can create computational models unthinkable even a decade ago. We can bridge fields of science that previously were either too labor intensive or not possible. You mentioned bioinformatics as, as one very clear illustration of such a field. Now, these are arguably systems of knowledge as much as systems of power. And I sometimes wonder if we are faced with black swan events or intellectual hubris. And are we so blinded by the promise of technology that we're not really attending to our blind spots, deploying and embedding systems that doesn't even have the level of maturity required to function properly. What are your thoughts on this? The, I think that's a very good uh, question and it's a real worry that one can have because on the one hand, we, are, we have a very fast changing world. I, uh, I said it's in, it, it changes in a matter of years and at most decades, uh, while the previous uh, revolutions took centuries. So we, we have a very fast pace uh, and uh, the institutions, any human institutions by nature is uh, sticky, so to speak. Uh, it, uh, it cannot uh, change uh, overnight. Uh, and so there is, all, there is a, a real risk that we, we hurry answers that are not appropriate, that freeze uh, a, an, an issue uh, in a way that is, that is wrong. And so it's a kind of dilemma because either we don't have the answer and then we have this gap between institutions that are not really fit for purpose for the new uh, challenges uh, created by, by this new economy, uh, or we, we think we have created the right institution, but we we did it too quickly, and it and, and it doesn't work. But we are stuck with what we just uh, created, and I think that's a, that's an argument to rec to to recognize that in some ways small is beautiful. Uh, that it's good to have a variety of attempts uh, and responses in the world because then we will have a better chance of seeing what works and what doesn't work. The difficulty of what I'm saying here is that indeed, because the world is so connected, uh, there has to be 
some kind of interoperability <laughs> uh, between the various various structures and answers. And so it's not so simple to say, well, there is a European answer, and there's an American answer, and there's a Chinese answer, because they, they have to they have to connect uh, with each other. They have to be protocols that help, help them work to, to, to together. And that's one of the beauties actually of, uh, uh, of this world. So I, I am I'm well aware that saying we have to have different, a pluralist, uh, plural way of answering those very technical uh, issues uh, is easy, easier said than done. Nevertheless, I do think that's a direction we, we, should, uh, we should aim toward. In your recent book, you outlined some not so pleasant scenarios, yet you end on a surprisingly upbeat note, speaking of a new future, suggesting a response that restores the balance between the empowerment of the individual and the need for a collective dimension of life. You spoke about this multi-layered ways of looking at, at human life. Such a response, however, you argue, will require new modes of representation and governance. You alluded to some of them already, but can you elaborate on this a bit more? Yes, well, it's a, it's really a core concern of mine. It's this, let's start with the, this balance between the individual and the collective. Uh, I, I believe that all societies that work, they have a balance between the dynamism of the individual, and that has been the strength, I would say, of the Western tradition. Uh, the idea that each individual is the master of her or his life, that every human being is a new beginning, so to speak. Uh, and at the same time, that uh, an individual that only looks after herself or himself, that's the age of the selfie. Uh, and that is not a society, uh, and that's terrible. And so it is this balance between having a strong sense of one's independence of mind. I mean, I, I said how much I value the independence of mind, and at the same time, the independence of mind has value only if it doesn't serve just you, uh, if it's uh, something broader uh, than you. So that's, that's for me, uh, the essence of a good society. And I, as I said, there are different ways of balancing the individual uh, and, and, the, and the collective. Now, how does one uh, do that? I think today there is clearly a crisis of representation. Uh, uh, and in some ways it is accelerated again by the age of data, because when on Facebook you can like uh, post uh, or not like it, uh, there is this false sentiment, uh, feeling that the world has become a kind of universal parliament, that you can uh, express an opinion at every second of your life on whatever catches your fancy. And, uh, and, you know, there are some practical aspects. You want to, to buy a television, you look at uh, various uh, opinions of consumers and uh, and so the world is a permanent voting machine now uh, through the internet and so the notion uh, well, that, perverted perverted agora yes a perverted agora that's a great uh, great expression yes uh, and so the notion that you uh, that you elect a representative and that representative will have her or his own views, that you're not going to tell uh, your representative how to vote on each and every issue, because that would uh, kill the debate in, in, the, in parliament. That idea of electing a representative, of freezing your capacity to choose for several years, uh, it looks almost quaint uh, in this world of daily, if not minute by minute, uh, choices and the false uh, sovereignty of the individual. So we, there's a real crisis of representation, uh, which in my view can, uh, is going to be very hard to solve. Uh, I think it starts from the bottom up. I think it starts from uh, smaller communities where you have a greater sense of the link with the representative. Uh, but I also think that it requires uh, what I described earlier, a different balance between what is knowledge 
and what is uh, democratic accountability. I, I think that separation is, is something, and that relationship is something vital to recreate a certain sense of legitimacy of the people who represent uh, you. So there is, a, so that's one thing. There is a crisis of, of representativity. There is also uh, a crisis of authority, uh, so to speak, uh, which is linked uh, to the crisis uh, of representativity. You, uh, today, you'd want a leader to be just like you, actually. Hence the success of Trump, of a certain level of vulgarity. And uh, uh, you don't want a leader that you admire. You want a leader that uh, with will you feel you could have a beer. Uh, nothing wrong, you could say, with that. But at the same time, something dangerous in the way that it perverts the idea of, uh, of leadership of someone who is, again, prepared to think by herself or by himself. You would want the leader, you want, you want to lead the leader. <laughs> and that's a contradiction in, in terms. Hence, this, uh, this transformation of politics, where more and more uh, you have uh, leaders who are more uh, clowns than uh, leaders. Institutions must be eminently adaptable. Uh, that anybody who claims to have the final answer today uh, is wrong and dangerous. Uh, there is no such thing as the, as the final answer. And in my book, uh, I, don't, I don't claim to have definitive answers. Uh, I think there are some areas where uh, one can explore uh, new solutions. And I think also there are some wrong solutions. Uh, let's start with the wrong solutions. I think the notion, for instance, of direct democracy uh, is very appealing in the age of uh, the likes of Facebook, in the age of a, sort of a, a, day, uh, a continuous parliament where you vote on everything at every minute of your life. Uh, so... Uh, it appeals to people who don't want to freeze their views for five years while their representative uh, votes uh, for, for, for them. But uh, direct democracy, uh, I think it can work in small communities. I think it can work on some clearly defined uh, ethical issues. Let's say a question like abortion, uh, the uh, question that really engage a whole uh, society. I think on many issues, uh, direct democracy, when it moves away from, uh, uh, fr 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 from the immediate concerns of the people, is rather dangerous uh, because uh, it, the deliberation will not uh, be very solid because direct, uh, it, it's impossible in a big uh, body. Uh, you cannot deliberate uh, with millions. Uh, and so it ignores what is the most important thing in democracy, which is not the vote, but the deliberation before the vote. So one way around that, according to some, is to have a democracy by lots, where you have a, a group of citizens uh, drawn by lots who will deliberate on various issues. Uh, I personally have my doubts on that, except again for some issues which engage every member of society. But I think on a number of issues, it allows for manipulation by interest groups. Uh, not that parliament cannot be manipulated by uh, interest groups, but at least parliamentarians, they are professionals. And so they are in some ways better prepared not to be uh, manipulated. I saw in France, uh, President Macron uh, had a climate convention. Uh, I personally think that that convention was very much manipulated by a number of people. And it was not, in my view, and the, the proposals they came up with, 
some made some sense, some did not. Uh, and so I, I don't think it's a very good answer. Uh, I think it's possible only on some issues where uh, there are deeply held uh, beliefs among the people, and then you can have uh, you can have a discussion. But on issues where the question of knowledge again uh, is very important, uh, a faithful representation of a dysfunctional society. Uh, will be as dysfunctional as a society it represents. <laughs> uh, it's not by being more accurate than the people who are elected uh, that you're going to make it better. Uh, the, the real issue is the quality of the discussion. And there we come to what we have discussed before, the balance between the legitimacy of knowledge and the democratic legitimacy. So to, to sum up, I mean, the uh, answer to your difficult question on the institutions of the future, I don't think there is one single answer. I think in some cases uh, on, for small communities, uh, some uh, degree of direct democracy where you can have a debate, uh, you know, a scale of a village uh, is possible. I think uh, on some issues, you can have a democracy by lots, uh, but it's really, you have to pick the issues very carefully. I think on most issues, the importance is to clarify the relationship between independent authorities that whose legitimacy is really based on knowledge and the democratic uh, sovereign. Uh, and there it's about, it's for the democratic sovereign to discuss, to debate and to decide on the level of risk a society is prepared to take. And it's for the uh, expert institution uh, to, to, to enlighten uh, that uh, discussion. And, and that's true, you know, for many institutions, you think of central banks, for instance, monetary policy, the, the average uh, citizen does not have much does not have a clue on, you know, M1, M2. <laughs> uh, this is not uh, something that most of us are familiar uh, with. What is the, the political decision? You see, for instance, in the United States, the Federal Reserve has to, as a goal, uh, has to have uh, full employment. In the European Union, the only goal of the central bank is the stability of the currency. That's a political choice. Uh, and then the bank does its business of trying to achieve uh, that uh, political requirement. I think for many specialized uh, entities, uh, this, is, uh, this is a good way to go. So I think the institutions of your future, yes, a measure of direct democracy, a measure of democracy by lots, a better balance between uh, uh, the uh, logic of the knowledge and the logic of uh, democracy. And then the last issue, of course, is how do you connect the local to the global? Uh, and that's one of the hardest issues. And I think probably the best way is precisely by having a clear distinction between the logic of knowledge and the logic of democracy, because you're not going to have a global uh, democracy. Uh, uh, you can, this is because there is no such thing as a global uh, community, and it would not be a good thing because I mean it's utopian, but it's not even desirable uh, because it would kill the notion of pluralism of a variety of answers. But what you can have is a clear articulation between different levels. That's what the, I mean, in my book, I have a long chapter on the European Union, and uh, I started my political life being much uh, quite a federalist uh, on Europe and I have changed. Uh, I think that's uh, that's too much. It ignores the, the fact that people are rooted in a particular uh, community. And I think the beauty of the European Union is that it tries to articulate a, a legitimacy of expertise that is embodied in the commission, which is far from perfect which has sometimes uh, emphasized too much what was not expertise, but a particular doctrine of the time of the moment, uh, rather than real expertise, but in some other cases has done a better job. Uh, so there is a legitimacy of expertise and there is a democratic legitimacy, which is embodied not just in the European Parliament, but in the European Council, a variety of institutions. And that 
that is still very much a work in progress. Uh, and Europe will be probably uh, in the future a kind of variable geometry uh, animal, uh, where on some, and it's all, it already is, you know, not all members of the European Union uh, have uh, the euro as a currency. Uh, uh, some uh, European member, members of the European Union uh, are part of the defense policy of the European Union, some are not. I mean, it's evolving now. We see uh, Denmark changing its, uh, its position. Uh, so I think that kind of flexibility is, uh, is an intelligent way uh, to, uh, to connect the local with the global. Uh, now, of course, I worked a lot. I worked many years of my life in the United Nations. Uh, and I have to reflect on what's the future of the United Nations in such a world. I think the United Nations, uh, probably the best way it can contribute to bringing the connection between the local and the global is in providing a forum where some common goals are defined. You see it in, uh, for instance, on the, on the critical issue of climate, uh, where this, there's a process through knowledge with the IPCC, uh, and at the same time, there's a political negotiation to define some shared goals. And so in a world where it's so difficult to find a north, so to speak, uh, having an institution that help identify uh, a, a common shared goal, even if it's messy, uh, long, uh, complex, it's an, it's an important function that leaves each nation, each uh, smaller group, uh, a master of the implementation, but that creates some sense of coordination, cooperation and common purpose. So I think these are the kind of nuanced and messy answers that, uh, that will help also re re uh, reclaim a bit of legitimacy for politics. Because one of the reasons that we haven't discussed why politics uh, are in crisis uh, today is that indeed uh, people, and they're not wrong, when they vote for their leaders, they feel that their leaders have only limited, uh, a limited capacity to influence their future. Uh, that even the biggest countries uh, are not fully, I mean, uh, uh, China depends on uh, what will be the economic policy of the United States and vice versa. Uh, and these are the biggest countries in the world. So that's even more true uh, for smaller uh, countries. Uh, uh, and so I think this way of organizing the different layers of action, it's a way to reclaim a sense of agency among the smaller actors. And that sense of agency in turn, uh, recreates a measure of legitimacy for, for politics. And that's very important because the legitimacy of politics is what recreates, what helps rebalance between the individual and the collective. Uh, and if you don't have that, then you only have a fragmented uh, society. So we need, uh, we need politics. Uh, we need to revitalize uh, politics, but we need to have a, a more rigorous view of politics, where politics do not claim to do what's better answered by science, but at the same time, the scientists do not claim to dictate their answers to the politicians. Let us shift the topic I know is important to you, leadership. In your previous book, The Fog of Peace, which is essentially your memoirs of your time leading global peacekeeping efforts, and also leading them through a very painful and as a result transformative period for international peacekeeping more broadly, you provide a simple yet profound lesson on being a leader in the UN in your book, responsible for the lives not just of those deployed in the service of peace, but also responding to the millions putting their hopes in what could be accomplished by these endeavors. Let us read a short passage from your book, which really speaks volumes about the intricacies of being a leader for a big global organization, but also about your leadership style. Before I became the head of peacekeeping, I had a reputation as an intellectual rather than as an operator. 
I never thought that being characterized as an intellectual should be taken as an insult. Although I know that it usually does not help a career to be called an intellectual or a thinker. It suggests that you cannot operate, but does not guarantee that you can really think. Having had to become an operator, I have not lost my respect for thinking, but I do believe that a lot of the thinking that goes on is useless for operators. The most useless way to pretend to help is to offer detailed specific solutions or recipes. There are dozens of political science books that look like how-to books. They do not have the texture of life and therefore fall off the hand. What I needed was the fraternal companionship of other actors before me who have had to deal with confusion, grapple with the unknown, and yet had made decisions. What I also needed was the solidity of true abstraction and the harmony of good visual art. What I needed was in times of difficulty, distance of the mind. The unfortunate truth is, however, that when you are immersed in action, you live mostly on the intellectual capital that you acquired beforehand. You draw on it. You may be accumulating in some corner of your brain new patterns, new chains of thinking that will eventually help you, but you're not really aware of it. And you certainly do not have the time to reflect on it. What helped me, what I could not find in any note, was the philosophical and ethical framework I had acquired in my classical studies. Yes, I think in, uh, in life you need some anchor. <laughs> uh, it's very important uh not to not to get lost you know i called my uh the title of this book was the fog of peace uh in reference of course to klaus fitz the fog of war but also the fact that the the way we define a society the way we define uh the goals of a society and certainly the way we define a peace process in the particular case of peacekeeping all that is is full of uncertainties uh, and life is about managing uncertainties and as you as you manage those uncertainties you can uh, you can drift uh, or you can try to have a, a steady <laughs> uh, you try can try to have a compass and that's why i talk about philosophers i talk about uh, sort of the abstract side of, of my of mind because it's it what it, it is what helped me get keep that sense of purpose and and direction uh, in the fog of action uh, in in which i was uh, immersed and i think when i reflect uh, now on what uh, a leader is uh, I think it's absolutely crucial and it brings us to this question of the individual and the collective it's it, it's crucial to to give a sense of direction not only for you but for the people uh you 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 lead that's the most important thing uh when i was at the united nations uh i used to tell my staff sometimes remember the first day you join <laughs> uh when uh, you are full of hope uh and that's the that's the important thing and i think for for a leader yes you need uh, all sorts of qualities like common sense and uh and hard work and uh, all the basics of doing a, a decent job but in some way the the most important uh, dimension is to make people proud of what they are doing to feel that they are doing something that is bigger than themselves, uh, that uh, there is something that is more important uh, than themselves, that their life, uh, as valuable as it is, it, it also encapsulates other people's uh, lives. It also helps other people's uh, lives. That's, uh, that's what I believe in when it comes to to leadership it's not something that you can really learn in a manual <laughs> uh, it's something that has to be grounded in your personal uh, experience uh, in my case uh, my parents uh, played a big role in that and when i joined the uh, the united nations uh, under kofi annan uh i think i was very lucky because i was serving someone i admired uh and uh 
in life, uh, admiration is uh, is one of the it's probably one of the best emotions because uh, admiration does not expect to be reciprocated. It's something that you can uh, have generously without expectation of return. Uh, and so it's a very it's it's very comfortable and very pleasant emotion to have. And with Kofi Annan, I uh, I admired him because he was uh, he had extraordinary human skills. I think he also he had this. In the, if I've learned something about leadership, certainly I learned it from him. Uh, this sense of embodying a certain a certain vision and mobilizing people for the service of that uh, of that vision and being a good listener at the same time having the the, the humility uh, that comes with real uh, leadership so the united nations helped me uh, develop uh, de de develop that and at the same time uh, when i was there and i at the headquarters in new york i often uh, felt you know, all the cynicism that exists in the world. And certainly the, the Security Council of the United Nations is uh, is not a place where you get optimistic, I mean, uh, even less now. <laughs> uh, but when I wanted to move away from the risk of becoming a cynic, uh, I would go to a, a peacekeeping mission. <laughs> uh, and there I would see the people for whom I was working. The, the poor people uh, who had been destroyed, whose lives has, had been destroyed uh, by war. And so that uh, meant that suddenly, I, again, I knew uh, quickly what I, was working, uh, what I was working for. And I think, again, leadership, it's, it's connecting uh, an ambition that is uh, not a personal ambition, uh, with the lives of people who have no voice and you give them a voice uh, and there's no better feeling than the sense that you you have given a voice to people who had no voice and do you feel Shamari, that we have the leaders and and also structures leadership structures that sufficiently has that moral compass that you talked about able and willing to take the necessary ethical stance in politics well, I think the the issue today, to be honest, is that uh, there's not much of a compass. Uh, uh, that the world today is dominated by the ideology of success and uh, success measured by monetary success, uh, and so the first uh, should be the richest, and uh, the last will just uh, uh, be. I mean. Uh, <laughs> Uh, be nothing, so to speak. Uh, that's the ideology of a society that is not a livable uh, society. And uh, in that context, uh, political leaders, uh, they are more and more often uh, just uh, identity entrepreneurs, so to speak. Uh, uh, there are different ways of bringing people together. You can bring them together on a sense of uh, an ambitious common purpose and something to do together. Or you can bring them together just by looking at themselves, <laughs> uh, what I call the age of the selfie. Uh, and uh, I think uh, many political entrepreneurs today, uh, that's what they do. Uh, that's what uh, Trump was doing with making America great again. Uh, it's not... It's, it's a false collective purpose. It's, uh, in reality, it's the vanity of each American that he was uh, flattering with a myth of an America that never existed. And I'm afraid Putin, when he wants to make Russia great again, that's also what he's going, uh, going after. So we have a lot of those political entrepreneurs. And those who are not like that, uh, too often they are caught up in the technicalities of uh, politics. Uh, and so keeping that sense, that ethical sense uh, uh, that uh, we are together because we share values, uh, that's what today is badly missing. Uh, 
uh, in uh, in many countries, uh, and uh, that's I think where there is much work to be done. And it's not work to be done necessarily by politicians. That's why I wrote my book, actually, uh, because I think it begins with a better understanding of the world as it is. Uh, uh, I used to to have some influence on the world uh, by uh, I mean, being an operator. <laughs> uh, now I'm not an operator, so I'm trying to have influence by helping shape the debate, by helping people understand the world we are in and i think if we have a, a better understanding of the world as it is maybe we'll have a better chance at uh, changing it just to add to what you said about a political entrepreneur shamari there's another trend which i'm curious to hear your views on which is tech entrepreneurs assuming political roles which is something we've seen a lot of lately informally and formally yes because uh tech entrepreneurs have so much power uh, concentrated in, in, in them. Uh, they, they often have a kind of hubris that uh, technology has the political answers, uh, which is a fundamental uh, error. Uh, again, uh, technology is not a machine to produce ethical choices. <laughs> uh, it's not, uh, but when you have the money, when you have the power, it's a natural temptation. And so you see entrepreneurs on the conservative side of politics, like Peter Thiel, and you see others on the more progressive side. But I think it's, uh, it's a very dangerous uh, approach, a dangerous way of looking at things as if uh, uh, the machine, uh, the technology could... Uh, have the answer. The technology helps us ask new questions. It does not give us uh, the answers. And uh, and this uh, new celebrity of tech entrepreneurs, uh, it's also a reflection of the personalization of politics and, uh, and of this ideology of success uh, that I uh, denounce, because of course they are enormously uh, successful people. So if you have success in one order, you have the answers for every order. That's the, that's the, that's the sophistry uh, uh, that, that we see. Uh, and personally, I think a, a good society is a society where there are several orders that can coexist. It's very good uh, to have good business people who create wealth, who create, uh, who, who can uh, really transform the economy and can enrich all of us at the end of the day. We need them, uh, and I have not. I don't have the the French uh, sort of prejudice that uh, against people with money. <laughs> uh, I think it's it's it, it's fine, uh, but I think it's it's as important to recognize that there are people who who may not be the smartest actually, uh, but who are very generous, uh, who radiate uh, their generosity and their humanity, and it's another way. Uh, to be successful in to 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 have a good life uh, without any 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 money, and you have people who who may not be that interested in generosity, who may not be that interested in money, but who have a passion for knowledge, uh, and who will spend their life uh, for that. And it's another order uh, of having a good uh, another way of having a good life, and a good society is a society that allows these different goals. Uh, it's the definition of pluralism, who accepts that people have different goals and there is not one order that dominates all the others. And I think that today we talk so much about the elites uh, and the word itself is symptomatic of our crisis, as if whether you're a successful politician, a successful businessman, a successful uh, scientist, it's all you are success uh, first. And it's the success that defines you rather than the goal you pursue. And that's, that's, a bad, that's a bad thing. It lumps together people who have very different ways of looking at life and each way is legitimate. Uh, but when you oppose uh, the elite uh, lumping together that very diverse group, as opposed to all those who are not the elite, 
you are reinforcing this ideology of success where everybody is ranked and there is a first and there is a last and there's only one way of ranking uh, people and that creates an enormous backlash because for the people at the bottom of the pile uh, if they are poor in a way they deserve it in that ideology uh, uh, and uh, uh, and they cannot be recognized and their humanity their dignity is not uh, is not recognized and that's a society that can create only very violent revolt because it's a society that fundamentally ignores the dignity of, of each and every human uh, being uh, and i think we we must uh, we must fight that and i guess it's also a question of if you have plurality with or without accountability yes of course because uh, the only accountability then is the accountability of success and you see how elections uh, become that because in a way if you're a winner i mean uh, in the caricature of democracy that we have today uh, instead of seeing democracy as a as a way to organize the deliberation uh, we see democracy just as a as the deciding mechanism so you win uh, you win the debate uh, you win the election you are the best uh, uh, that is uh, that is not uh how it should be and there is this sense that whether it's the determination of a price uh or whether it's a vote it's it's all the same it's all the same order of you sell a good you sell an idea uh you sell a political program uh the market of ideas of goods will determine uh, everything and that is there are there are things that are not uh, the market and uh, when you reduce in, even democracy to a market of ideas uh, you you exclude the idea that ideas they can change with deliberation and there's not uh, one idea that just crushes the uh, the others the ideas they are improved by the shock of ideas it's not about which idea wins it's about which idea allows an idea, another idea to flourish. So my last question for you, Shamari, touches more on your long career and first-hand observations and experiences with both the extraordinary compassion humans are capable of, the beauty of humanity, but also as someone who really seen the heart of darkness, to borrow a phrase from Joseph Conrad, the darkness of humanity. And I wonder what keeps you up at night, Shamari, and what inspires you to this day, gives you hope? What keeps me up at night uh, now is the steady increase in violence in the last two decades. Uh, it's a violence that is blunting our sense of humanity. And you, you've seen it in the wars in Syria, and now Ukraine very much looks like Syria with destroyed cities with uh, no respect whatsoever with basic principles of international humanitarian law. Uh, you see sieges, you see people, uh, prisoners being killed, you see all sorts of atrocities. Uh, and uh, we are getting accustomed to it. And uh, I talk about Ukraine, but you could talk about what's going on in Ethiopia. You could talk about many places around the world where violence is a daily occurrence and uh, and it's accepted as a natural way of uh, managing uh, affairs, of managing politics. And that international violence has its counterpart in the internal violence of societies. And I think the two are linked. Uh, the sense that uh, we live in communities where we share values, where we share a sense of common purpose, that is disappearing. And so that's really what keeps me up at night, the sense that our world is getting more and more violent and that the fragile fabric of society is fraying. Uh, and uh, my experience of uh, peacekeeping of countries that had been broken by conflict is that when that fabric of society frays, it's very hard to uh, stitch it back together. Uh, but at the same time, and that's what gives me hope, frankly. 
uh, what uh, I have seen in conflict affected countries is that it certainly reveals the worst of humankind. It does reveal also the best. Uh, I think it's a test of humanity and uh, in lives that where we are not challenged, uh, we can uh, we can live uh, in a way in mediocrity. Uh, when uh, we face the tragedies of war, uh, we, that reveals the best of humanity too. And uh, I believe that at the moment, uh, at the present moment, there is a certain renewed sense of the tragic dimension of humanity. And I do hope that that will give us the, the moral strength to rebuild uh, societies, the societies that are, that are fraying. I have met, when I was uh, in charge of peacekeeping at the United Nations, I've met some extraordinary people who in the midst of destruction and violence were showing that every individual can make a difference and were trying with all their moral strengths to rebuild a, a society. And that's, that is what, uh, in spite of all that is so dark and, uh, uh, and worrying in today's world, that what gives me a sense that at the darkest hour, there is a certain human resilience that will help us uh, overcome the the tragedies that we are presently facing. Thank you so much, Jean-Marie, for sharing your time with us, your stories about what inspired you and excerpts from your new book and deep insights and expertise. This has been a rich and if I may say so, also very sobering conversation about the state of the world. Thank you to our listeners for tuning in and a special thanks to the team at the Carnegie Council for hosting and producing this podcast. For the latest content on ethics and international affairs, be sure to follow us on social media at Carnegie Council. My name is Anya Kasperson, and I hope we earned the privilege of your time. Thank you. <laughs>